In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning I'm going to invite the praise team up. If you were here on January 1st, you heard this song sung by the group uh, Big Daddy Weave. And today we have our Central Baptist version. It gets a little crowded up here. So as Pastor said, we are singing Big Daddy Weaves Redeemed. Um, and wh what a great concept, right? Redeemed. And uh, you heard Brian talk about it earlier. Why is it that we can stand in the face of trouble and in, in the face of joy and just always, always have that joy and security in our heart? It's because we are redeemed. Now, some of us, I think somebody stepped on the... Uh, Amp there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just press that button again for me. Thank you. All right. So, um, as I was saying, it's, uh, you know, it is just a wonderful and beautiful thing to know that the Lord is always in your corner. Now, I know there's people here today that may not be all the way there, people who haven't yet made the decision for Christ. And so, um, what I want to do is just invite uh, Pastor up and uh, Phil and Jerry, if you guys don't mind coming up here with me. And they're going to they're gonna be here to pray for you. And if you want to make that decision, I'm inviting you to do it right now, today, while I'm playing this song. We're going to keep playing. Nobody's going to hear you, but they're going to be there as resources for prayer. So if you need prayer or if you want to make that decision today, I encourage you, do it today. You'll never look back. Same, and I hope that will carry me on. 
from 2 Samuel, verses five, uh, book 5, verses 17 through 25, and can be found on page 478 in the Pew Bible. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephim, so David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and track the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord answered him, Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, the Lord has broken out against his enemies before me. So that place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Once more the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rephim. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, do not, go up, do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines all the way, to, all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. May God add a blessing and, uh, and also help us with our understanding of his word. <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? That David went to the Lord, and the Lord said, when you hear the sounds of marching in the treetops, you'll know it's time to go. You know, if only life was that easy, sometimes we wish we had a, a, a solid sign like that. Over the years, I've received calls and visits from many people asking for guidance. Sometimes it's about taking a new job, leaving the old one, and change is always uh, always a little fearful. We don't know what the future will hold. Sometimes it's a question about a relationship. Should I stay or go in that relationship? Or maybe it's even whether to relocate because of some opportunity, uh, to move away from family and friends, to, to go somewhere you've never been before. You know, I know many of us probably if you had the opportunity to go to Hawaii for six months or a year, maybe you'd do that. But, but if God said, I want to move you somewhere, where you haven't been before. That's scary. And, and we want to know, I think, God's will in these things. We want to know what we should do. And so when people call me and, and they ask me this question, how do I know what God wants me to do? You see, once we've been redeemed and given our lives to Christ, these decisions tend to be much harder to, for most of us. You know, you probably expect me to say it should be much easier once we've given our life to Christ. But they become harder because it's no longer just about us. 
We want God's blessing. Before we came into Christ, we'd just do whatever we wanted, whatever made us happy. But now we have a new orientation, and we want to live out the purposes that God has for our lives. We want our lives to be a reflection of His glory and His presence. We want to, we want to, uh, to, to find a way where we can honor God. So my simple answer to their question is often to follow the advice of that old hymn. It is trust and obey. The hymn says trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I think that's Kay Perone's favorite song or one of her favorite songs. You know, life is not easy. One question often raises another one. Okay, I'll trust God, but how do I truly know that the answer I'm getting is truly from God and simply, not simply my unconscious mind trying to appease my own will? You know, I shared this illustration before. A number of years ago, serving in Norwich, I got to know a lot of people over the years and a lot of Christians from other churches. Well, this man from another congregation came to me, made an appointment, and uh, he wanted my advice. I should have known it wasn't good when he didn't go to his own pastor, <laughs> kind of like Nicodemus, came under the cover of night, he didn't want anybody to know, he was seeking counsel, and he said to me, you know, things aren't good at home, they haven't been good for a while, but then I met this woman at work, <laughs> and you know where it goes, oh, she's a Christian too, and, and, and together we have these great conversations, and, 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 and it's like God sent her to me for having to toil in my relationship for all those years that wasn't good. What do you think? Should I go with her? And I said to him quite plainly, I said, well, the God I know, the God of our Father Jesus Christ, would never tempt someone to go into adultery. That's the enemy of God who would tempt you to do that. And so the voice you're hearing is not God's voice because God's word is clear on that. What you should do is you should go home and you should talk with your wife and sort things out one way or the other. But don't go off into this fantasy world. That is not God's will for your life. Now that's a hard message to give, maybe a harder message to hear. But sometimes we see these things that are happening in our life and we say, this must be from God because look at how wonderful I feel. But the reality is, is that not everything that is wonderful, feeling wonderful at a moment are not real. And so we have these questions. Everything needs to be tested against the word. If you want to know where God, what God wants for your life, it's all written down for you. And I don't have my Bible here. Here we go. It's all written down for you right here in the Word. You want to know what God has a plan for your life, what He wants you to do? Then you need to get into the Word. Sometimes I think we look at the Bible as a coffee table book or a collector's item. You know, I have about 12 or 15 Bibles. I don't read them all the time. Maybe you have a couple too. Someone gave you a Bible. Maybe you bought a Bible and you, you started off hot and heavy into, into, into reading daily and, and then after a while it's on a shelf or on a table somewhere. We all have Bibles or access to them, but we don't use them. The truth is that God, like I was telling the children, gave the Bible to us as an instruction manual for life. Yeah, there may be a lot of stuff in here that you don't understand. Maybe they don't, it doesn't seem to pertain to your life at this given moment. We don't have Philistines attacking us, yet we're reading about David here. Because there's some truth in that story. There's some truth in, in, in the Bible that, that may apply to our situation. And if we've never read it, we don't know it. If you read the Bible, you'll get an understanding of this, though. You'll get an understanding of what God wants for you and for your life. Tells of His love for us. Uh, uh, Pastor Joshua McClure wrote the book, The Crimson Thread of the Bible. And he talks about from the beginning to the end, you can see this message of salvation plainly in the scriptures about how God would have to send Christ to redeem us from our sin, to give us a new life now and forever. The Bible tells us of that love, tells us that problems will get in our way, get in the way of our relationship with Him. 
And he reminds us, though, that in the midst of all that, we have a friend in Jesus, a friend that was willing to give his life so that we might have life. That means there's no decision that is too small to go to God for because God is there for us. The apostle says this, apostle Paul says this, whatever you do in word or do deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father. I like that. Whatever you do. That means that God cares about your everyday life. God cares about the things going on right now in your life and my life. God cares about the decisions that we're struggling with to make. There's nothing in your life or my life that God doesn't care about. If we are asking and looking... God will show us the way. We just need sometimes to look for the signs, to keep our eyes open, to see those things that we often pass by every day, and to listen for God's still small voice before we do anything. That's why I keep sharing the invitation to come to our our Bible studies, our small groups, because in there with others, sometimes something you've been wrestling with will, will all of a sudden be the topic of the day. And some of our regulars will know that. We're not the first ones to have asked for a sign. You know, we talked about Gideon a little bit last week and how Gideon tested God. Well, well David, King David, uh, also was looking for signs as he does the things he do. He did. King David asked for one about 3,000 years ago. Brian read the text. The Philistines were wreaking havoc on the nation. They had killed King Saul and his son, and they, they were ready to take over the land. And David, because of Saul's death, was now raised to the position of king that he'd been anointed for. And he hears the word, the Philistines are coming. He knew the Philistines. He dealt with them before. They were a vulgar, cruel people. And they were going to take over Jerusalem, take over all of Israel. David, uh, David was facing his, real, his first real test as king. As the Philistines stood just a few miles away from David and his men, David paused, though. Instead of just going headlong into battle, he paused and he prayed. He asked God for direction. And God said to him, go up. I'll give the Philistines into your hand. I will be with you. You know, God says that to us too. You've got some challenge, something going on. And and when you pause and ask God, God tells you right off the bat, I will be with you. Do not be afraid. Again, I love that. Somewhere I read a few years back, 365 times in Scripture, the Bible tells us that God says, I will be with you. Do not be afraid. Doesn't mean that everything's going to work out perfectly well, but that's His promise. Promise for every day of the year. January 22nd. February 19th, July 3rd, August 15th, December 2nd. All through the year, God promises that, that when you've got a trial, when you've got a challenge, I will be with you. Victory is sweet, but in real life, it always, it doesn't usually last that long. There's always another challenge. We get through one thing, and then there's something else. And so it was with David. Soon after his first victory, the Philistines regrouped and they came after him again. I think the the Giants and the Eagles played three times this year, right? Yeah. I'm sorry about the Giants. Ah, I was pulling for them. (laughs) I'm sorry for the Eagles fans. Oh, I'm getting in trouble here. Okay. Um, But you, you win one game and the next game, not so much. So it was with David, soon after that first victory, the Philistines regrouped and they came after him. And notice before he did anything, the scripture tells us that he went to God again in prayer. And I love this. God told David to get ready and to wait. When he heard the sound of the footsteps marching in the wind, then he was to step out and strike the Philistines. Now how often have you prayed before making a decision? Too often we end up trusting our own instincts and abilities. We look at a situation and we either jump in because we're confident we can handle it, or we shrink back because we're intimidated by what we see. We can learn a lot from David. After all, he was the one who went up against the giant Goliath. You remember that story? All the king's men were standing there in fear as they looked at the Philistines on the other side of the line and this giant of a man. 
He was a boy, but he knew God. He didn't go into battle thinking, I'm great with this slingshot. I can take him. No. The scriptures tell us that he sized up the situation and he came away thinking, he's big, but I know my God is bigger. Together, the two of us can't lose. And he went into that battle and came away victorious, not because he did it with his own strength, although he did use the talent and the gift God had given him, but he went into that battle with God standing at his side. God gave him the victory. This is important to remember when you face a challenge or decision. Stop and have a little talk with Jesus before you jump in. Remember who God is and what God can do. If you aren't sure, again, I point you back to the Bible. Open up the Word of God. Then wait for God to give you a sign. Throughout the Scriptures, we see men and women facing major decisions. Each time they go to God, He gives them a sign to show them the way. When talking about prayer, the Apostle Paul takes it a step further. In his letter to the Thessalonians, he suggests that prayer should be our default position and continuing thing as we walk through life. He says, pray without ceasing. He doubles down on this in several other places in his letters. In other words, our lives should be marked by prayer, a continual relationship with God through each day, every day, all through our lives. Every decision, large or small, should be wrapped into our daily conversations with God. You know, you like my tie? You know, when, when, when I want to pick a tie that goes with my suit, I have no taste whatsoever. I hope this one matches. Uh, usually, though, I go to Lori and I say to her, does this tie match? Maybe some of you other guys do that too. Does this tie match this suit? And I go to her because I trust her. I trust her opinion. And so it is when you go to God with the questions and the decisions that you have to make, you're saying to God, I trust you. I'm going to you because you're the one. You know. You know better than I do. The more time we spend with God, the greater the confidence we have that He'll never let us down. That's why you can, like Brian and Janet, and I didn't have this in my thing, but I know some of us asked, They've, they've had quite a year. And then God blesses them with this beautiful baby, this grandchild. And then just before Christmas, ready to celebrate family all together, they have the fire. How could Brian, Janet, come back to church? How could Brian stand up here? Because he talks to God every day. And he knows that God will be with him. Be with him and Janet, no matter what the future holds because of that ongoing relationship. And there are many here who have that kind of relationship. That's what David had. And that's why it's so powerful to read his stories and to learn from them. Here's another thing. Let's be honest. Most of us decide that we're going to do something and then we invite God along. <laughs> I'm going to buy a new car. Okay, God, what do you think? <laughs> I've already decided that who didn't ask God's opinion. And there are a lot of things like that, big and small, that we do. And then when we do something, and no matter what it is, we fail, we, we look to God and say, where were you? <laughs> Why didn't you honor that? Why didn't you bless that? I told you I was going to do it, right? Isn't that how many of us do it? But again, that's not what David did. David went to God first. He was going up against this big battle, and he said, what shall I do? He wanted to know where God was going to be and then to act. And God said to him, when you hear the sound of footsteps on the trees, then go, because you'll be joining me in the battle, and I will give you the victory. I think that's important. God said, go over there. And what happened? He had the victory. Truth is, God will always show us the way if we go to Him first. You know, um, uh, I want to close with this story, and, and some of you maybe have heard it, some haven't, but uh, I started my ministry at the Cross Mills Baptist Church in Charlestown. I was in seminary, and I was a student pastor, and, uh, and served there for, for almost two years. I loved it. It was great, uh, a great 
congregation, very small, very loving people. And as, as Lori and I were kind of developing our plan for life and what we thought God wanted us to do, at the end of that two years when I had graduated seminary, we, we were thinking, where is God leading next? And, and as it happened, there were four congregations that, that were, were open and available to us. And, and so we had to make the choice. Do we, do we go to upstate New York, where there was a, a, a nice church? Do we go to uh, three other places? One of them was Norwich. Um, and, and it's so funny, because I went to my pastor, and I said, Reverend Brooks, how do you know? How do you know? I've got these four opportunities coming up, and what is the one that God wants me to? And, and he, you know what he said to me? He said, well, it's kind of like falling in love. You just know. And I thought, hmm. Well, we did the interview process and, and we went through it. And the one that I really wanted, the one that Cal Lord thought would be great because it, it was a, a larger salary. They had a, a beach house down on the shore and, and it seemed like all the kind of things that would really make my life happy. And, and so I really wanted that one. Lori and I went to interview and uh, it was the worst interview ever. I, I, Lori remembers that. I think they wanted her to, what, what did they want you to do? Do you remember? Yes, they wanted Lori to be the head of the cooking committee. <laughs> okay, so, you know, my wife said, uh, maybe that's not the place. There were a lot of other things that went into that. And then there was the fourth place. I ranked them one to four and, and, and my lists of pros and cons. And, and the fourth place was Norwich. And I remember coming into Norwich, there was a Dunkin' Donuts on the hill and you could see over the river. And, and I said to Lori, as we were there, I said, that's going to be a tough place to minister. I don't think, well, we'll go and talk to them. We went and talked to them, and they brought out finger sandwiches. And you've got to understand, another church I went to, they brought me to Rossellini's. Is that what it's called? You know, and, and gave me a steak dinner, and they, you know, we didn't drink wine or anything, but they kind of wined and dined us. You know? It was so great. At Norwich, they brought out finger sandwiches and cookies. <laughs> And we talked, and, and the man who gave us a little tour around town, he's smoking his cigar. Lori's eight months pregnant. <laughs> he's smoking his cigar, and he's showing us the town. We left there after that interview, and we're, we're driving over to Lori's mother and father's house, and she says, what did you think? And I said, they'd be foolish if they don't want me because it just seems so right. And after 26 years of ministry in Norwich... It was the right decision because we had gone to God and we'd asked and we said, God, you show us. And he revealed it. I could hear the sound of footsteps on the hills and town. So whenever, I want to say this to you, whenever you're making decisions, look around before you move on them. See if you can find where God is working and then go to God. Ask if that's where God can use you and he will give you a sign you got to look for it sometimes, but the sign will be there. But it begins with prayer and then offering yourself to God's will. Say, God, I'm here. Let thy will be done, not mine. And it may not be the sound of marching in the treetops, but it could be the sound of footsteps in the wind showing you where God is leading you. So let Him lead. Go with God. And let that be the way you make your decision. Amen. We're going to close off our service today by singing another hymn. Take my life and let it be. It's a hymn and a prayer, number 568.